for uh, what we would refer to as Passion Week. And again, I, I realize wholeheartedly that there are some people who, who disagree as to exactly what day of the week Jesus was crucified, buried, and uh, on. And so that's, uh, that's, a, that, that's, again, a totally different subject. And if you ever get interested in it, I'm sure there's plenty of videos online that will talk about the, uh, the issues involved. But anyway, I think they pretty much use the traditional timeline. And so if you take a look at page 95 of your study guide, we're going to be reading that box a little bit later about the two feasts, Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Um, but again, during this week, Jesus has, on what we call Palm Sunday, uh, made the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And of course, there was the fulfillment of Zechariah's prophecy. You know, he rode on the, a, a colt of a donkey. Um, we, we talked about his entering the temple. We talked about him going on Monday and cleansing the temple. We talked about Tuesday of Passion Week where he was confronted in the temple by all these different religious leaders trying to humiliate him, and he turned the table on them, culminating with his recognition of the widow and her two mites. Then, last week, we talked about the fact that um, Jesus, as he left the temple, to, for, for, um, prophesied the destruction of the temple, then he goes up onto the Mount of Olives, and he gets into this discussion that we call the Great Eschatological Discourse. And again, I am aware, there are plenty of different opinions as to how that ought to be interpreted. And there's, there's questions as to why Jesus seemed to switch back and forth. But again, he's trying to respond to two questions that were asked uh, by the disciples, and he kind of answers in a, them in a backward pattern. But again, this is at least a framework <clears throat> for us to be thinking about for what we call the end times. So when we talk, say something is eschatological, eschatos is the Greek word for last. So eschatological is a study of the last times, or what we would call the, the end times. So now we're going to talk about Jesus lets himself be taken, and we're going to start uh, in Bethany at uh, Mary and uh, Martha and Lazarus's home and the anointing of Jesus and all that entails and we're also going to be introduced again to a character by the name of Judas who was not very happy with what things were going on and so he went out and betrayed Jesus so verses 1 through 11 of chapter 14 please After two days, it was the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might take him by trickery and put him to death. Not during the feast, lest there be an uproar of the people. And being in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at the table, a woman came having an alabaster flask of very costly oil of spikenard. Then she broke the flask and poured it on his head. But there were some who were indignant among themselves. Why was this fragrant oil wasted? For it might have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. And they criticized her sharply. Let her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a good work for me. For you have the poor with you always. And whenever you wish, you may do them good. But me, you do not have always. She has done what she could. She has come beforehand to anoint my body for burial. Assuredly, I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial to her. Then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went to the chief priests to betray him to them. And when they heard it, they were glad and promised to give him money. So he sought how he might conveniently betray him. Now on the hey, Very good, very good. All right, so um, what in the world is going on here? Your study guide says it's appropriate that the setting of Mark 14 is the Jewish Passover. 
At the original Passover, lambs were slain as substitutes for firstborn children. Now Jesus would die as the fulfillment of that symbol. And so if you go down below, there is a box entitled Two Feasts. So again, we need to remember that this is the nation of Israel. These people are Jewish, and they're keeping the Jewish feasts. And there's an actual year a, uh, where they actually keep different feasts during the year. So would somebody read that box about the two feasts? Passover was the yearly festival of national redemption. The Passover lamb was killed in the afternoon of the 14th of Nisan, a month corresponding to our March of April. The Passover meal was eaten after sunset, which is the start of the new day, the 15th, but before midnight. The Feast of Unleavened Bread began on the 15th and continued through the 30, 21st day of the same month. By Jesus' time, the two feasts were treated as one, so that essentially Passover was a week-long festival. Okay, and so if you take a look at there's kind of a, a calendar down below, and uh, that is based on uh, the Jewish calendar. So that's why it changes with our calendar. Because um, we have a calendar that is based on 365 and a quarter days a year. And uh, the Jewish calendar is 360 days a year. So every month has 30 days exactly. But then every fourth year they have to add an extra month. And uh, so it's, it's a little bit different than ours. So, and they have names, different names uh, as well. All right, so then it says the story of a woman anointing Jesus is positioned in Mark's gospel in such a way that one might assume the anointing occurred during the Passover. However, John 12 reveals this anointing actually took place on the previous Friday. Mark included the story here not to confuse the order of events, but because its meaning was closely related to Christ's death. Jesus himself identified this anointing as a burial rite. The Gospel of John also reveals that the woman who anointed Jesus was Mary, the sister of Martha and Lazarus. Mary wanted to show her love and respect for Jesus, so she brought to him one of her most valuable possessions. Now, again, um, this ointment was not just like something you'd buy for for $5.98 at Walmart and, you know, put on your hands to, to make it feel better. Uh, this was a very, very expensive nard and had uh, very in special um, herbs and spices and everything that went into it. So this was very, very costly. In fact, um, after she does it, those who object say it might have been sold for more than 300 denarii. And uh, my Bible footnotes it. This is a year's wages. Okay? So that's a lot of money. It's a very, very valuable thing. And it probably would have been used very sparingly, but she anoints his body as if for burial. So immediately there's objection. And again, we're not really told uh, in Mark's gospel who objects. But uh, it's obvious that Judas is one of them because then he immediately goes out and, and betrays Jesus. And we'll get to that in just a second. But anyway, so uh, she, she breaks the jar. She pours it over him. She anoints him for his burial. The people object. What is Jesus' response to her, to, him, to them, about her? Always be spoken in memory of her. This is a memorable. Okay. Yeah. So that's the bottom line. Yeah, okay. <laughs> but the first point is leave her alone. Yeah. Why do you trouble her? And he commends what she has done as it is right and appropriate. And then in reference to their comment regarding the poor, what does Jesus say? Hi, Mark. Come on in. Yeah, you always have the poor with you. And um, now, this does not mean that Jesus was in any way 
shape, or form putting down poor people or that he was putting down uh, gifts or support from the poor. Basically, he was saying is, this is something you could do at any time, but I am here only once. This is a unique event. I am preparing for my death, and she's anointing me for my burial, so leave her alone. But then, what Patty said, Jesus goes on to say something, and now, again, for those people who say the Bible is anti-woman, Jesus, just earlier, has commended an old widow lady for her contribution and said that she gave more than everybody else. Now he is commending this woman for her act of kindness and her anointing him. Okay, He's not commending the disciples. Okay, He's not commending the men. And then, if you go on with the story a little bit further, which we are going to do, at his death and burial, who is it that goes to the empty tomb and finds the tomb empty? Who is it that Jesus greets first? Amen. Yeah. So, it's a woman again. So, so don't in any way, shape, or form say think that the Bible's anti-woman or puts women down. Yes, the Bible definitely says that men and women are different. And yesterday... In the wedding, I actually read from Ephesians, and it makes it very clear that God has different roles in, in the marriage relationship between men and women. By the way, women who hate that passage fail to realize that what is said about women is very small. What is said about men is much larger and much more involved. Okay, But anyway, so that's a very interesting thing. And so he says, Truly I say to you, wherever this gospel will be preached, Throughout the whole world, what she has done will be spoken of a memorial to her. So here we are on November the 19th, 2023, in Walla Walla, Washington, and we're talking about what she did. Okay, so this is the fulfillment of prophecy. You were helping to fulfill prophecy. Did you know that? Okay. All right, so let's take a look at Jesus offers his body and blood in chapter 14, verses 12 through 26. This day of unleavened bread, when they killed the Passover lamb, his disciples said to him, Where do you want us to go and prepare that you may eat the Passover? And he sent out two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the city, and a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him. Wherever he goes in, say to the master of the house, The teacher says, where is the guest room in which I may eat the Passover with my disciples? Then he will show you a large upper room, furnished and prepared. There, make ready for us. So his disciples went out and came into the city and found it just as he had said to them, and they prepared the Passover. In the evening, he came with the twelve. Now, as they sat and ate, Jesus said, Assuredly, I say to you, one of you who eats with me will betray me. And they began to be sorrowful and to say to him one by one, Is it I? Is it I? It is one of the twelve who dips with me in the dish. The Son of Man indeed goes just as it is written of him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had never been born. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Take, eat. This is my body. Then he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many. Assuredly, I say to you, I will no longer drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Okay. 
So this is absolutely rich in symbolism, and it is hard for us as Gentiles who live in the 21st century to fully understand everything that's going on here. So uh, last year, or earlier this year, on, on Good Friday, we uh, did um, show a video by the Jews for Jesus on the Jewish Passover celebration of today and how all these different elements point to Christ. But when you watch one of these, you understand some of the things that Jesus was, was doing here. So, first of all, it says when it, this took place, it was on the first day of the unleavened bread, when they sacrificed the Passover lambs. The question was, where do you want us to prepare this? Now, you've got to realize that Jerusalem was larger than a village, but it wasn't really that big of a city. And so when Jews came from all over to celebrate the Passover, it swelled as far as its population <coughs> was concerned. And it would have been very, very hard to find any open space whatsoever. And yet, Jesus has been staying in Bethany, Sabbath day's walk from Jerusalem. And yet, he is fully aware that there is a room that is already prepared, already set aside for them, which is very interesting. So what he says also is extremely interesting. He says, go into the city, and a man carrying a pitcher of water will meet you there. What is interesting about that? Men, didn't carry water. Men did not carry water. That was a job for women. That was a woman's job. And oftentimes in those days, they actually carried it on their head and uh, for, whatever, for whatever reason. And so it would have been very unusual to see a man doing a quote-unquote woman's job. So here they go back into the city, and there's literally thousands of people, people thronging the streets, people everywhere, and they readily see this man doing something that he normally wouldn't be doing. And so they follow him. <laughs> and uh, when they get there, he says uh, that they're supposed to ask, uh, where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he shows them this large upper room, all prepared. Now again, the odds of finding a empty space was almost unheard of. So there, the questions that come to mind is, had Jesus prearranged this? Or did this man, believing in the scriptures, each year actually have a space prepared. Now, did you know that when the Jews celebrate Passover today, they, they set their table and they always have an, one empty spot. And who is that for? Elijah. Elijah, exactly. They believe Elijah is going to return. And again, I think it's their faulty understanding of the Messiah. They real, don't realize he's already come. Jesus has come as Elijah. But yeah, so they, they leave that spot open. And if you've been watching these videos with us on Sunday nights, um, the Jews who want to rebuild the temple fully expect the Messiah to return. And so, which is very interesting. All right, if you take a look at page 97 of your study guide, there is a box entitled the Passover meal. <clears throat> so as they get into the supper, Jesus now is the host of the su uh, supper. And as the host and as the rabbi, the teacher, he does something recorded in John that is not recorded in Mark that is unthinkable. And that is, he does, what does he do to the disciples? He washes their feet. He washes their feet. And again, that was a job normally relegated to the lowest servant of the house. When people walked into a home in the Middle East, they took their shoes off and their feet and their sandals were filthy dirty from the dirt streets and everything else that might be on the streets. And so, again, you can go to John and read that. But read now about the Passover meal, somebody please. Passover meal followed a traditional pattern. A family or group of friends would meet for the meal after sundown. First, the head of the group would say a prayer over a cup of wine. Then they would all eat bitter herbs 
remind themselves of the bitter times their ancestors had endured in Egypt. Next, they would pour a second cup of wine without drinking that. They would also serve the meal, the main dish of which was specially prepared roast ram. But they would not eat the meal until they had recited the Passover liturgy, had sung Psalm 113, and had prayed over the unleavened bread. A prayer over a third cup ended the feast. Finally, they would sing Psalm 114 through 118 and drink another cup of wine. So when you take a look at what is was going on here, it is, is literally full of, of symbolism. And uh, again, um, Jesus predicts that one of them is going to betray him. And when it talks about dipping the sock, if you had a chance to watch that video that we showed, there's a time when they actually dip into this, this dish. And so Jesus is trying to indicate, you know, they're all saying, oh, was it me? Is it me? And probably your study guide points out that even Judas probably going, oh, was it me? <laughs> Knowing full well uh, who it was. Uh, as you know, the other scriptures tell Jesus, Jesus says to him to go out and do whatever it is you need to do. So, All right, another thing is that many of you have seen Leonardo da Vinci's painting of The Last Supper. And we have kind of a little model of that sitting on our communion table that was donated to the church. And that's very beautiful, but it is totally inaccurate. Okay, For one thing, they didn't sit in chairs at tall tables in those days. And the other thing, it probably wasn't a long table. It was probably more of a square or a circle. And so um, things were a little bit different. And they reclined, so they had like pillows that they were leaning back on. So it probably looked a lot different than Leonardo da Vinci's uh, you know, depiction of it. But it still helps us remember it. So anyway, as Jesus is going through this, not only does he dip and he predicts, but it's very interesting when he took and he broke the bread. And it says in verse 22, take, eat, this is my body. Remember in the video that we showed you at, at, at Good Friday time, there was a time when they would actually break this unleavened bread, and then they would hide it in a, in a bag, and this was taken and hidden someplace, and then the children were, would go to find it, whoever find it, finds it would get some sort of a reward for doing that. And again, many people believe this is emblematic of Jesus' death, burial, and then resurrection. But anyway, so when, when, when Jesus broke this unleavened bread, which was traditional, he changed the meaning totally. He said, this is my body which is broken for you. <clears throat> so he is now telling them that he is becoming their Passover lamb. And if you need to read the book of Hebrews, actually we've been doing that on our Through the Bible reading, <clears throat> and the book of Hebrews is just absolutely loaded with um, uh, ramifications, with, with allusions back to the Old Testament and to the Jewish system of, of worship. So then it says, then he took the cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and he said to them, this is my uh, the blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many. So again, there were four cups during this Passover meal. This is cup number three, and it's referred to as the cup of redemption in the traditional meal. And now Jesus, again, changes the meaning, and he says that this is his blood, that his blood was going to be shed for, for them. What is interesting, your study guide points out, when he says that, truly I say to you, I will drink no more of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it in the kingdom of God, <clears throat> many people believe that he did not drink the fourth cup. Okay, which was traditional. He said he would not drink that cup until everything is fulfilled. And so many people believe that he will do that after his second coming. So, Anyway, um, when it says they sung a hymn and went out, there were various hymn, uh, psalms that were traditional as part of the Passover meal. And I think it's Psalm 122. I, I think was the traditional one that they would sing, and then they would go out. Well, when they went out, 
they just didn't go out. They went out to the Garden of Gethsemane at, at the bottom of the Mount of Olives. So elsewhere, we have Jesus' words, do this in remembrance of me. And so when we have the Lord's Supper, uh, when we break bread together, whatever you want to refer to it as, you want to call it communion, there's very various titles. What we are doing is basically a reenactment of what Jesus did to remember his, his, his death for us. So, All right, let's take a look at Jesus' per, uh, prophesies and praise in verses 27 and 42. All of you will be made to stumble because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I have been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. Even if all are made to stumble, yet I will not be. Assuredly, I say to you that today, even this night, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. But he spoke more vehemently. If I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And they all said likewise. Then they came to a place which was named Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. And he took Peter, James, and John with him. And he began to be troubled and deeply distressed. My soul is exceedingly sorrowful even to death, stay here and watch. He went a little farther and fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. Then he came and found them sleeping. Simon, are you sleeping? Could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again he went away and prayed, and spoke the same words. And when he returned, he found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy, and they did not know what to answer him. Then he came the third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? It is enough. The hour has come. Behold, the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Okay, so um, you have this denial uh, portrayed, and again, I think in some of the Gospels it has it before they go out to the Mount of Olives. But he has it right after they have left to the Mount of Olives. But again, he says that this will be fulfilled, and this is a fulfillment of Zechariah chapter 13, verse 7, when it talks about, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. Apparently Peter is uh, offended by that. He says, oh no, you know, I'll never do that. And again, Jesus says, you will betray me when? Exactly. And so, um, he says, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. And uh, if you go to Israel today, you can go to a church that is built over what they believe was Caiaphas' household. And on the roof of this church is a rooster. And in Latin, it is 
uh, Christ in Galaticu. In any way, a famous tour guide cannot pronounce Galaticu, and so he would tell people, we're going to the church of the cock a doodle doo <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, uh, that was one place that really affected me because um, not necessarily the church and the dungeon down below, but outside they have excavated what they think is the courtyard, and then there are these steps that go down the Kidron Valley, mm -hmm. and they believe that Jesus would have been brought up those very steps, and it was in that very courtyard where Peter would have denied him, and that, that really, really struck me. Me too. <laughs> yeah. So um, the other thing is you get a perspective as to where Jesus went that night, because you can actually uh, see the Temple Mount, you can see the, uh, the Kidron Valley, you can see over towards Gethsemane, and uh, you get a perspective of how this was all really very closely inter interrelated. But you're either going downhill or uphill, believe me, it's, it's steep. So they go to uh, Gethsemane, and Gethsemane means what? Oil press. The oil press, right. And today, if you go to Gethsemane, there are ancient olive trees, and uh, many people go into what is called the Church of All Nations, which to me was not impressive at all. It's just this huge, fancy church. But what impressed me was that our tour guide spoke to the uh, groundskeeper, and he unlocked a gate and led us into the garden area. And here are where some of these old trees that are perhaps 2,000 years old. Now, they probably were not there when Jesus died because the Romans probably destroyed everything, but they probably relate to that era at least. And in that garden was the basic area where Jesus would have been praying, where the disciples would have been sleeping, and um, there is a, a statue on one end of Jesus uh, on his knees praying. What's interesting to me is that when you stand in this garden and you look to the west, you have to look up to the Temple Mount, and what do you see? But the Zion Gate. And again, many people believe that was the main, one of the main entrances to the, the Temple Mount, at least coming from the Mount of Olives. And so it's a very inspirational place to be. And this, this picture uh, makes it look like some of the olive trees are what, this big around? Yes, right. I happened to look yesterday right. at one of my pictures. Right, they're gigantic, right. I don't like right. that. And not very tall. No. Maybe kind of ugly. Right. Right. No, I have pictures in my slides as well, and uh, that's why they say they believe some of these trees may go back about 2,000 years, and so they may be descendants of some of the original trees that were there. But yeah, they are huge. They are, are huge and still producing. So this was a place where the, uh, was a garden. This is where they they pressed olives, and of course Jesus was going to be pressed. Okay. In those days, they squished the olive to squeeze the juice out of it. And what Jesus was going to endure was, was very, very difficult. By the way, if you take a look at page 98 of your study guide, there's a little bit of a map there. And so um, if you take a look at that map, you see the, the temple mount is in the thick double diagonal line, whatever you want to call it. And then there's all these other little lines that would, would, would have had to do with the walls of Jerusalem. Anyway, one would have been the place of the Last Supper. Two is Gethsemane. So again, you see you're actually going down into the Kidron Valley and up there at the bottom of the Mount of Olives. And then three, the House of Caiaphas, <coughs> where we talked about where this actually betrayal took place, is back close to the upper room. You had to go down and back up uh, again, this spot. All right, so Jesus prays, and according to uh, the Gospel of Mark, <clears throat> okay, yeah, I, I turned the page. I didn't mean to turn the page. Okay, um, in verse 36, what does he pray? Before that. Before that, Abba Father. Abba Father. Now, Abba is in italics in in my Bible. 
So again, this gives you the, the idea that, once again, this is Aramaic. And if I understand it right, this is a word more like daddy than just a, a cold, sterile address of father, okay, or dad sort of thing. And so this shows a, a deep relationship here. <clears throat> now again, this is one of those mysteries uh, regarding the, the incarnation, how Jesus can be fully man and fully God at the same time, yet he says he only does what the Father tells him to do. He's praying to the Father. He's asking the Father if there's some way. And so I believe this shows the human side of Jesus. The man, Jesus, did not want to go through the physical torture of crucifixion. But then when you think about Jesus as being the Son of God, and you think about what happened on the cross, again, it's one of these mysteries how God the Father could turn his back on God the Son because of his bearing the sins. Um, again, that's a total mystery. I, it's beyond my understanding. Um, <clears throat> John Lennox um, has been asked how he as a scientist can believe that Jesus could be fully God and fully man at the same time. He says, well, let me ask you a question. And he asked them a question, for instance, about energy. Do you believe in energy? Oh, yeah. Can you describe it? Do you understand it? Well, no. But you believe in it, right? So you believe in something that you can't explain, and yet you are going to condemn me for believing in something that I cannot explain. And he gets them to realize that we don't understand everything. And so there are mysteries of the universe that, that we have to accept. Um, you know, when, when you walk in your room, you flip on that light switch and you expect the lights to come on because we have electricity. But most of us really don't understand electricity and, and, and how it gets to where we want it to be. I mean, we can talk about different avenues through wires and things like this, but ultimately it's, it's beyond our, our understanding, so. Yeah. In Jesus saying, not my will but thine be done, mm -hmm. should we take that as to say that he was not willing, because he was holy, to become sin for us, because that was so against his nature? Well, what I think you're saying is that the crucifixion was multifaceted. So you have the physical torture that the man, Jesus, was going to have to endure. And he really didn't want to have to do that. I mean, this is not something that anybody wanted to go through. But then when you talk about Jesus as being the Son of God and bearing the sin of, of all humanity, that, again, is something that is, is difficult for me to even comprehend. And again, Jesus understood why he was there. But yet, he still prays that this somehow could pass from him. But the answer, basically, from heaven is no. There is no other possibility. Um, some of you have seen the movie The Passion of the Christ uh, by Mel Gibson. And he puts things into that movie that are not scriptural. Okay? They, maybe they happened. I don't know. But in that movie, you have Jesus in the garden, and Satan comes to him and tries to tempt him. You know, they're not worthy. You know, but why are you going to do this for them? You know, type thing. Now, again, that's not told. We're not told in Scripture that that happened. I, I don't. Under, I don't know. All I know is that Jesus was in great agony. We're, to, we're told elsewhere that he actually sweat drops of blood. Yeah, to me, that sounds like more than the natural, because many people have been crucified, and they knew they were going to be crucified. They didn't sweat great drops of right. blood. There wasn't that kind of agony with it. Right. But with Christ, there was. And I right. think that has to do with the bearing of sin, which is so opposite to the first. Right. So again, you're saying this is a multifaceted yes. event yes. because he's both fully man and fully God. Yes. The interesting thing is the disciples had no clue what was going on. They were tired. They had eaten dinner. And they fell asleep. <laughs> and they kept falling asleep until Jesus said, come on, it's time to wake up. So let's take a look now. 
uh, at the next section of scripture, which is Jesus is arrested, tried, and disowned. In verses 43 through 72. Mm. And immediately, while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, with a great multitude with swords and clubs, came from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. Now his betrayer had given them a signal. Whenever I kiss, he is the one. Seize him and lead him away safely. As soon as he had come, immediately he went up to him. Rabbi, Rabbi. And kissed him. Then they laid their hands on him and took him. And one of those who stood by drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. Then Jesus answered and said to them, Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to take me? I was daily with you in the temple teaching, and you did not seize me. But the scriptures must be fulfilled. Then they all forsook him and fled. Now, a certain young man followed him, having a linen cloth thrown around his naked body. And the young man laid hold of him, and he left the linen cloth and fled from them naked. And they led Jesus away to the high priest, and with him were assembled all the chief priests, the elders, and the scribes. But Peter followed him at a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest, and he sat with the servants and warmed himself at the fire. The chief priests and all the council sought testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but found none. For many bore false witness against him, but their testimonies did not agree. Then some rose up and bore false witness against him. We heard him say, I will destroy this temple made with hands, and within three days I will build another made without hands. But not even then did their testimony agree. And the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, Do you answer nothing? What is it these men testify against you? But he kept silent and answered nothing. Again, the high priest asked him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? I am. And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes. What further need do we have of witnesses? You have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? And they all condemned him to be deserving of death. Then some began to spit on him, and to blindfold him, and to beat him. Prophesied. And the officers struck him with the palms of their hands. Now as Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came. And when she saw Peter warming himself, she looked at him and said, You also were with Jesus of Nazareth. I neither know nor understand what you're saying. And he went out on the porch, and a rooster crowed. And the servant girl saw him again, and began to say to those who stood by, This is one of them. But he denied it again. And a little later, those who stood by said to Peter again, Surely you are one of them, for you are a Galilean and your speech shows it. Then he began to curse and swear, I do not know this man of whom you speak. A second time, the rooster crowed. Then Peter called to mind the word that Jesus had said to him. Before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. We have like eight minutes, and we could spend the entire time this morning just on this, this section of, of Scripture. But there's no way that we can go into all the details. I will say this much. If any of you subscribe to J. Warner Wallace and his emails, uh, his article this week had to do with the Gospel of Mark and why 
people think that it was actually Peter's Ooh. testimony that Mark was recording. And he has a whole list of reasons why that he has used in his forensic analysis of, of this gospel. It's very, very interesting to read. One of the reasons that we are convinced that Mark at least was a partial witness to all of this is the little story found in verses 51 and 52. And many people believe that Mark was that young man who hastily had thrown a gown on to go see what was going on, and it got ripped off as he tried to, to, to run away. Again, because he just says a certain man. He doesn't say himself. So, But anyway, there is um, very, very good reason to believe that this is Peter's uh, account that, that Mark is interviewed Peter and that he is recording here. So, again, very briefly, because we don't have time to go into it, uh, you have Judas' betrayal, where he calls Jesus rabbi, interestingly enough, which is teacher, which is appropriate, but he does not refer to him as Lord by any way, shape, or form. Uh, you have, in, uh, elsewhere in the Gospels, the high priest's uh, servant's name was Malchus. And if you have watched the movie The Passion of the Christ, one of my favorite scenes is that when everybody leaves the garden, Malchus is still standing there going, <laughs> like this. I, I, it's hilarious. I, I thought it was great. But uh, anyway, uh, again, we could go all into this, but again, Jesus believes that this is the direct fulfillment of Scripture. This is not a tragedy. It is not an accident. This was all prophesied in Scripture. So you need to remember this. Now, you have two trials going on, and we will do that very quickly. On page 101 of your study guide, would somebody read the box, The Trials of Jesus? Jesus had two trials, one Jewish and one Roman. Each of these trials had three parts. The Jewish trial began with a preliminary hearing before Annas, a former high priest, John 18 and 19. You don't have to read those. Yeah. Next, the Sanhedrin tried Jesus in the quarters of the, high, of the current high priest, Caiaphas, in Mark. This trial ended with an official condemnation of Jesus at daybreak. The Jews took Jesus to the Roman governor of Judea, Pontius Pilate, to question him. Then Pilate sent Jesus to be examined by Herod, the ruler of Jesus' home territory. Finally, Pilate gave a judgment against Jesus. And so we could just say so much about this. For one thing, this was against Jewish law. Okay? The time of the day they did this trial. Uh, there's all sorts of false witnesses. You can go into that. You can talk about the, the high priest. Elsewhere in scripture, Jesus may have actually made an insult. Oh, I didn't know that you were the high priest. <laughs> Which means he's basically uh, not even accepting uh, who this man is or his political position, uh, position. But let me just bring out one thing here. There are many who say that Jesus never claimed to be God, okay? Because they look in Scripture, and as the Muslims will tell you, they will ask you this. If you meet a Muslim, he's been trained to ask you this question. Where did Jesus say, I am God, worship me? And that sentence is not in the Bible. They know that, okay? But there are many, many, many indications when Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am, they wanted to kill him. Why? Because he was claiming to be God. Right here, okay, uh, again the high priest asked him, are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed One? Verse 62, Jesus said, I am. And then he said, you will see the Son of Man, that's a messianic title, sitting at the right hand of power, and coming with the clouds of heaven. And apparently that phrase, coming with the clouds of heaven, is only something in the Old Testament that God did. So the immediate reaction was, the high priest tore his robe saying, what need do we have of any further witness? You have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? So when Jesus made this statement, he was clearly claiming 
to be God. And it was based on this that they condemned him to death. Because all this witness testimony they bring in, you, you know, you have to have agreement between at least two witnesses, and they all had different stories, you know. It was all cooked up. So, again, if, if you ever get into a discussion with somebody, this is one of those times when Jesus clearly was claiming to be God, and the high priest knew it. He tears his robe. He says, this is blasphemy, and they condemn him to death. Then you have Peter's denial of Jesus. And again, um, it was very emotional to me to go to the church of Galatiku, the church of the Cockadoodle But again, I wasn't impressed with the church building or even the dungeon down below. What really impressed me was when we were standing outside and you're looking at the ruins of this courtyard, you're looking at these steps that go down the, 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 uh, into the Kidron Valley, and you realize this is where this took place, just as Jesus predicted it. And again, one thing that we need to understand is one of the things they had against Peter was his accent. So, for instance, if you meet somebody from Alabama, and you're talking to them, you may want to ask them, gee, are you from the Deep South? Because just the way they talk, okay? I have met people from New Jersey that I could not understand a word they were saying, even though they were speaking in English. Their, their New Jersey accent was so thick. Okay, I've had friends from New England who are going to go out and drive their car, you know. And so you know they're from New England. So we have regional accents. By the way, something I noticed. When you listen to the news on the radio, do you realize that most presenters speak in what we would call a standard English? There are very few who have some sort of a regional dialect or accent. So, But anyway, so that's one of the reasons why they knew that Peter was not one of them. He was not from Jerusalem because he sounded like a Galilean. He actually had this, this uh, accent. Anyway, uh, again, there's the three uh, denials, just as Jesus predicted. The cock crows for the second time. It hits Peter, and he is bawling. So who would have known that other than Peter? Okay, and, and so this is Peter's own confession, and Mark is retelling the story. Again, there's a whole lot more that we could say about that. But next week, in chapters 15 and 16, we're going to get into Jesus lays down his life and takes it up again. So, again, this is just an overview, but it's summarizing some of the events of that night.